So, um, see, the final, the final keynote address, um, I'll just try to glue the two, um, the last panel and this uh, together. Um, so, um, I'd seen Chris talk in the spring at the New England Aquarium about uh, whales and noise pollution. And uh, I was thinking, how, how could we look at, we could protect this resource? And I was out sea kayaking uh, off of Cape Cod with one of these VHF transceivers. And when I get bored when I'm sea kayaking, I just turn it on and listen to the chatter, what's going on. And uh, I heard frequently that the Coast Guard would come on and advise that there would be a right whale somewhere and would caution mariners to stay away from the location of the right whale. So they have a certain function in protecting um, a re marine resources. So um, we're lucky today to have the Rear Admiral here. And to introduce him is um, Richard Lazarus, who is a uh, professor of law here at the law school. And he specializes in environmental and natural resource law. Right. Richard. Thanks so much. Well, it's my great uh, pleasure and my honor uh, to introduce uh, Rear Admiral uh, Stephen Pullen uh, to Harvard University and welcome you here and to the Radcliffe Institute. Uh, Rear Admiral Pullen uh, assumed the duties of commander of the 1st Coast Guard District in May uh, 2016. Uh, in that capacity, he oversees 11,000 active duty reserve civilian and auxiliary personnel who perform Coast Guard missions um, across the eight uh, northeastern states, uh, including over 2,000 miles of coastline of the United States. Uh, he served in a variety of legal, governmental affairs, and personal uh, operational assignments in the Coast Guard, uh, including command uh, ashore as well. He also served as special advisor to the Vice President of the United States, as well as the Coast Guard's liaison and the State Department's uh, Office of Ocean Affairs. Um, and with that, I welcome you. Thank you. Well, it's a tremendous honor for me to be here today, and I'm truly humbled that I have the privilege of providing the closing remarks for this uh, productive and informative symposium. Uh, the exchange of ideas and our dialogue will certainly make a difference in protecting our oceans. Uh, before I get started, just because we had a kayak story, I'd be remiss as a coastie if I didn't say, I hope that you wear your personal flotation device <laughs> and carry a light. <clears throat> and you dress, good. Very good, very good. You know, I, I really enjoyed uh, getting a chance to see the posters over the lunch break. Um, so I, I commend all the scientists and the scholars that uh, did all the hard work and, and put together uh, that great research and analysis. It's truly inspiring. You know, as a Coast Guard officer, I took uh, very keen interest in the study concerning uh, ocean locomotion. Uh, there was also a study on the use of robotics uh, to aid in search and rescue. Uh, there was one presentation on the mapping of genetic resources, and I know that's a very big issue that we're dealing uh, with internationally. Uh, the, uh, the rights to genetic resources uh, beyond national boundaries uh, is a very hot topic. Uh, and there are a lot of other presentations. I was also struck by uh, the great work that's being done um, on uh, the pressures and impacts of ocean vortexes on risers, if I understood uh, the analysis correctly. I was a uh, incident commander during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I was down there from the time the Deepwater Horizon exploded until we turned the lights off at the incident command post in Mobile. I was responsible for cleanup operations in Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. Uh, so that certainly is something that I took great interest in. Uh, you know, I think it's important that we all continue to push our thinking and our innovation on ways to tackle uh, the stress on our oceans from increased global competition, growing use, uh, greater exploitation, as well as emerging issues such as warming water, uh, rising sea levels, and pollution. And I'll talk a little bit about marine pollution here in a bit. Uh, we must ensure that we're good stewards of our oceans and that we do all that we can to ensure sustainability. Uh, so I congratulate and thank Radcliffe uh, as well for sponsoring this symposium. Uh, it's very timely and absolutely what we need to catalyze action. So thank you very much. 
Now, so why after a full day of listening to astonishingly smart scientists and scholars am I here? <laughs> I'm neither a scientist nor am I an academician, although I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. I, I couldn't resist, guys. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> Honestly, I, I am a bit intimidated to be here um, in, in front of such distinguished uh, scientists and scholars because I got a D in calculus. Um, and that's one of the reasons I decided to go to law school. I knew I would never have to calculate the area under a curve <laughs> in practicing law. <clears throat> the, the good thing about being a lawyer in the Coast Guard is that we're all line officers, unlike uh, the other military services. So uh, we get the opportunity to get out to the field and uh, do hands-on Coast Guard operations, which is what brings me uh, to Boston, as you heard. What brings me to the Radcliffe Institute here today is my hope that I can provide some context, perhaps even a new perspective, on the need for cooperation and collaboration in protecting our oceans. My further hope is that I can share some insights on how we as a community can collectively manage the oceans. Um, you know, just to set the framework, I believe that the key is committed partnership and cooperation. The pillars of this effort must include individuals, industry, science, academia, governments at all echelons, and non-governmental organizations. All of these will play an essential role in ensuring the vitality of our oceans. Uh, the Coast Guard is a nation's federal maritime law enforcement agency. We're an environmental protection agency, and we're the nation's maritime first responder. We also safeguard and facilitate safe maritime commerce and maritime activity. Obviously, then changes in the ocean environment, changes in climate patterns, are of great interest to us. We need to be agile enough to adjust to these changing conditions to continue to do what America expects of its Coast Guard, and I should say what America expects of your Coast Guard. So I'm going to ask your indulgence first um, to help me give you a thumbnail sketch of uh, the Coast Guard. I find that most people know a little bit about the Coast Guard because of such personal interaction, uh, but perhaps you don't know uh, the comprehensive picture of all that we do as an organization. Um, the Coast Guard's a military service. We reside in the Department of Homeland Security. This is a snapshot of our workforce. 41,000 active duty personnel, which is just a little bit larger than the New York City Police Department if you can believe it. And then we have 8,000 members of the Federal Civilian Service, and I'm very thankful that we have a surge capacity of 7,000 reservists who have the status of reserve members of the other military services. And we have 30,000 civilian volunteers who we call auxiliarists. You saw one earlier today asking a question in, in his full Coast Guard auxiliary regalia, so I was neat, it was neat to see that. I should also say that we're hiring, so if you want to enlist, <laughs> Please come up and see me. I know it's a shameless plug, but I'd be remiss as a Coastie if I didn't ask you to join up. And as you can see, our core mission is making pizza. <laughs> as much as we like pizza, our core responsibility in reality is to ensure America's sovereignty along 95,000 miles of U.S. shoreline and the associated territorial sea, as well as to protect America's sovereign rights throughout the 3.4 million miles of our exclusive economic zone. While our name Coast Guard suggests that we operate in the littorals, it's somewhat of a misnomer. We are globally deployed and we operate as far out to sea as possible. When it comes to intercepting threats to America's homeland, we want to play an away game. We don't want to play goal line defense. When it comes to maritime threats and transnational organized crime, we intend and we do project effective presence offshore. Now we have 11 statutory missions and it would take me all of my allotted time to discuss the parameters of each of those missions with you. Uh, I think it's better that I'm, I just sort of give you a summary of what we do. And here is it broken down into three general categories, maritime safety, security, and maritime stewardship. But even those are hard to get your arms around. So what I like to say is we 
protect America from threats delivered by sea, we protect those on the sea, and then we protect the sea itself. I think that's a much more understandable way of knowing the Coast Guard and what we do. It's that third mission that I want to talk mostly about today, and that is uh, maritime stewardship protecting the sea itself. And when I talk about maritime stewardship, I'm talking about marine environmental protection, and I'm talking about our responsibilities for living marine resource enforcement. Now, I've bared my soul to you about my lack of scientific prowess. And I'm going to step carefully into, into some scientific data that I feel is uh, very compelling. Now, it's not my work. If it were my work, it would be D quality, as we all know. <laughs> and I think uh, the prior panel did a much better job than I could ever dream of doing in talking about what we're seeing up here in New England with respect to migration of fisheries and warming ocean trends. So, um, but it's in my slide presentation. I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, this is not my data. The credit goes to uh, Pink Sea Labs uh, at Rutgers University. It goes to NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service, the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, and the Millstone Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, the first data set that you see is from uh, Connecticut uh, Department of Environmental Protection. It reflects their analysis of temperatures in Long Island Sound. And these are temperatures that were reported by the uh, Millstone Nuclear Power Station. Regulations require them to report temperatures twice daily. And this is a trend from 1976 to 2015. And I know, uh, again, this is uh, maybe a difficult uh, curve to read. Um, but what it shows is this. The blue lines start at 76 and go through 2015. The green line, which is above the bell curve of the blue, is reflecting temperatures of 2012. And then the red bell curve is reflecting the 2015 temperatures that started lower but then went higher. In essence, what this graph shows is empirical data that water temperature trends in Long Island Sound are getting warmer, or is in 2015 experiencing lower lows uh, but higher highs. The next slide shows the uh, changing distribution of lobsters over time, and I think it validates the temperature readings from Long Island Sound, and I think it also validates what you heard earlier. Uh, the Pink Sea Lab at Rutgers analyzed the data that NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service had been collecting for years. And I believe these results are uh, quite traumatic when you look at the trend. The red reflects the higher density of lobster uh, and the bluer, uh, lower density. Looking at the comparison uh, between the 70s to the 90s to 2015, I think it's clear that the lobsters are migrating north and east in general. And as I understand it, the current scientific explanation is that the lobsters are moving to remain in colder water as that water trends north. And just as another data point, perhaps, uh, Connecticut used to land about 3.7 million pounds of lobster a year, worth about $12 million in 1990. But in 2014, that amount diminished to about 127,000 pounds. Now, to show you that um, this isn't just about lobster, as we heard earlier, this is also about trends in other species, such as black sea bass. Uh, this shows the movement from Maryland, Delaware, starting in the 70s, steadily moving northward up into New England by uh, 2015. Uh, again, the point is that marine life is adapting to ocean temperature change by migrating north and east to remain in uh, cold, colder water. Now, one of the other reasons why I wanted to show you this data was not so much to show you the trends. Uh, as I said, others could do that much better than I. Uh, but it's to reinforce the point that partnership and collaboration is essential because this data was assembled, compiled, and represented by the great work and collaboration of industry, state, academia, and federal agencies. Uh, the sharing of scientific study, uh, data, and information uh, is a critically important element in managing our ocean resources. Sharing information will always have a unifying effect uh, that I think will promote a common understanding of the challenges and trends in the oceans. It will forge consensus on solutions and allow us to assess and forecast effectiveness. Now, I understand the sharing of technology, um, the sharing of proprietary information, sharing of intellectual property is, is a sensitive issue. That's not what I'm advocating. What I'm advocating is that we maximize our shared learning and our understanding of ocean science, that we seek to expand our circle of discussions uh, that engage the broad set of stakeholders that I mentioned earlier. Frankly, to me as a layman, 
uh, there are disparate views among stakeholder groups as to the nature and extent of the stress on our oceans, which also leads to disparate views on solutions. I think expanding information sharing will build confidence and consensus. I was in St. John's, Newfoundland uh, this week to talk about maritime safety and security in the Arctic. It was a symposium that brought together industry, academia, and governments to talk about how we improve safety, security, and environmental preparedness and response in the Arctic. Uh, the Ar Arctic's a strategic imperative uh, for many nations, so there has been much study and attention paid to it in recent years, especially over the past decade. What I found refreshing about that symposium was that all of us who spoke had a shared understanding of the problem set in the Arctic. The rising sea levels, the loss of permafrost, increased shipping and other man-made activity, remoteness and the tyranny of distance, and the lack of infrastructure. Our shared understanding of the problem allowed us to then focus our energy on discussing solutions. For the Coast Guard, we followed President Obama's lead in 2013 and published our own supporting Arctic strategy and implementation plan. Our strategic objectives in the Arctic, which is ocean space, is first to improve our awareness of all the activity, both man-made and natural, that is occurring in the Arctic, to modernize governance, which I think in part is to ensure that we can project an effective presence in that part of the world. The Arctic is not a new operating environment for the Coast Guard. We have been up there off Alaska since Alaska was a territory. But as we know, the challenges are growing and the need for a Coast Guard presence is growing and we must be able to modernize our governance. And the last underscores the point and the theme of my discussion here and that is we need to broaden partnerships. Now our Coast Guard motto is uh, semper paratus, always ready. And in order to maintain that high standard, it's important that we work with others. And in today's world of constrained resources and rapidly shifting complex matters, uh, the Coast Guard simply can't do it alone. Ensuring safety, security, and environmental responsible maritime commerce and activity are important goals, but uh, it's not solely a Coast Guard responsibility. It's a shared responsibility for all of us. Uh, we have to all recognize that we are actors in the continuum of actions related to the ocean. Uh, take, for example, the movement of the vessel. I view this as a continuum of critical linkages that involves the shipping company, shippers, maritime agents and insurers, the crews, and the government. Uh, there are many more actors in the chain, but I just wanted to give you, uh, sort of paint a, a picture for you by highlighting a few of what I consider the key actors. Uh, each element in the chain is a critical link that has an important role to play. Now, if you noticed, I put governments at the end of that chain because while I believe government oversight is important, it should not be viewed as the primary means of compliance to sound maritime practice. Governments cannot be seen as guarantors of safety, security, and stewardship because frankly the chain is just too big and it's too long. We must rely on the greater guarantee that each link in the chain will do its part. We need to rely on shipping companies to put in place good business practices and have robust compliance and oversight programs themselves. Crews must be well trained and they must understand the responsibilities. They need to be empowered by their companies and their officers to take action to mitigate safety, security, and environmental risks, including being empowered to come forward and report discrepancies and violations. And absolutely yes, governments need to fulfill their obligations as flag states, coastal states, and port states. Uh, this continuum needs to be a culture of shared responsibility. And I think that shared responsibility is made easier the more we collaborate and exchange information and best practices. Let me uh, turn to marine environmental protection, which is perhaps the uh, most visible and obvious area where we have a shared responsibility. Uh, preservation of our oceans means that we must tackle uh, persistent noncompliance with pollution prevention laws. In 2014, we investigated over 3,600 pollution incidents in our navigable waterways, 3,600. We conducted more than 25,000 inspections on hazardous materials containers, and we found over 5,000 discrepancies that if left uncorrected could have impacted our waterways. And we also continue to find vessels 
intentionally disabling or bypassing required pollution prevention equipment. And frankly, this issue confounds me. Now, criminal referrals vary from year to year, but overall, we have not seen a decrease over time. In 2015, we had 16 criminal referrals for environmental violations. And we saved those criminal referrals for the most egregious of cases. And that was up from 15 referrals a year before. When we do the math, only about 0.15% of all compliance boardings lead to criminal referrals. So let me be clear, I think that the vast majority of maritime industry are good environmental stewards. And they're serious about environmental compliance. I'm not here to suggest otherwise, far from it. I've seen vast improvements across the spectrum of the maritime sector. Uh, but it's an unfortunate reality that some companies and some individuals are unwilling to comply. And while I said this is an important responsibility of the Coast Guard, we could not do it alone. Uh, we count on uh, the committed support from other criminal investigators and also the Department of Justice who litigates these cases for us. Now, I was part of the early efforts in the Coast Guard where we tried to spur greater environmental compliance through launching criminal referrals. Before that, we relied mainly on administrative sanctions and other measures. And we thought that it would be a temporary program. Well, much to my, my regret, we're still in this line of business, and I don't want to be. We're seeing time and time again that we're referring the same kinds of cases to the Department of Justice for criminal action, and it's the same pattern. Dumping oil, falsifying record books, and lying to the Coast Guard, and encouraging others to lie to us as well. It just doesn't make sense in my mind why there is still a subculture of noncompliance in some segments of the maritime industry. I don't know why people, companies, would put themselves at risk and why crew members would put their own liberty at risk. Now, I appreciate that the reasons for noncompliance could be complex. But since the 1990s, when we launched this program, companies have paid over $330 million in vessel pollution fines. We've banned vessels from calling at United States ports. People have gone to prison. Companies have had to implement environmental compliance programs. They've had to do audits, their legal fees. There are significant costs associated with noncompliance. Yet again, we aren't seeing a decrease in referrals. So let me be clear. We have a continuing problem, but I think it's also clear that if we meet our responsibilities, that shared responsibility, and each part of that continuum of compliance does, it part, does its part, we can change the subculture. Now, you may ask, what can I do? I'm not in the shipping industry. I'm not an enforcement agency. How is this relevant to me? Well, I think we must continue to rely on science, and we have to rely on academia to help us develop the technologies, the processes, and protocols to help meet environmental standards. And I, I could give you a full array of examples, but I'm just going to give you a few to highlight my point. The first is we need to develop good oil spill detection technology. We need to stimulate oil spill technologies, oil spill cleanup technologies, especially to address heavy oils that sink and not float. We need technologies to neutralize aquatic nuisance species. We need capabilities to expand our maritime domain awareness. And we need metrics for assessing the effectiveness of enforcement on preserving the biomass. Now, my hope, again, is that we'll close this line of business, but the only way we can do that is with your help and with that shared responsibility that I mentioned. Protecting and sustaining living marine resources, or more commonly what we call fisheries, is a global concern. Uh, we face multiple challenges in our fight to ensure sustainable fish stocks. Um, we've heard throughout this symposium about trends uh, we've heard about the migration, we've heard about diminishing fish stocks. Uh, frankly, part of the problem is us, the global population uh, that consumes fish. The demand for protein is growing. It will continue to grow geometrically, I suspect. More than 3 billion people, many of whom live in the least developed countries, rely on food from the ocean as uh, their most significant source of protein. And more than 50 million people worldwide make their living based on the fishing industry. And again, I believe the vast majority of those are good stewards and want a sustainable fishery to maintain their quality of life. However, even here, we're seeing significant noncompliance. 
predominantly illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing known as IUU fishing. And according to uh, the UNFAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, about 15 to 30 percent of global annual catches are the result of IUU fishing. And it presents a direct, re threat, a direct threat to not only global economies, but I think global stability. And we're at the forefront of this challenge. Uh, we're trying to meet it head on here, not only projecting our own presence, as we do here in the First Coast Guard District, but also working with our partners and through the various international fisheries organizations. As we say in the Coast Guard, we want to take a round turn on this problem and get ahead of it. Uh, but we can only do that uh, with the committed support of our partners. The other thing that we need to do is we need to rely on our scientists and our academicians and our scholars to help us better project trends. Um, we need to better target our resources for fisheries enforcement. Uh, we can't afford to simply turn a screw and punch holes in the ocean. We need to do targeted enforcement because uh, resources are limited and we need your help in, in defining those metrics so that we know that we're putting effective resources on top of the problem uh, to ensure that we have sustainable fish stocks. Now, part of Semper Paratus, our motto, Always Ready, means that we have to take a hard look at what's coming at us in the future. And of course, we're very mindful of the trends that we're seeing in the maritime domain through climate change, rising sea levels. Uh, we're the Maritime First Responder Agency, so of course we are very concerned about what the effects will be on storm predictions and the severity and number of storms we may see in the future because part of our responsibility is ensuring the resiliency of the marine transportation system. But we are the Coast Guard. We operate and live on the coast. Our units are on the coast. Our infrastructure is on the coast. And I re recall a discussion that I heard uh, our Commandant Admiral Zukump talk about recently. Uh, he was talking about his recent visit to Greenland with a Jacob Chauvin glacier, and he talked about how that glacier has receded uh, 25 miles in only the past five years, and the dire prediction is that sea level could rise up to two meters. Um, and then he also talks about the National Snow and Ice Data Center and NASA's announcement that Arctic sea ice set a record low in March for the lowest winter maximum in the satellite record. And while the lowest maximum winter doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean we're going to see the lowest minimum in summer, it uh, certainly doesn't bode well. The trend's becoming uh, more and more clear, I think, and we are taking note of it. So it goes beyond just the impact of warming oceans on fisheries and the trends of migrating fish stocks. It goes beyond the displacement of indigenous populations in Alaska, which rely on Coast Guard support and protection. It goes beyond what we're seeing with some Pacific Island nations. Fundamentally, it goes to the Coast Guard's ability to remain semper paratus, always ready to respond to emerging threats as we see civil sea levels rise and encroach upon our critical infrastructure. So we are very much focused on planning forward. Now, this is somewhat of an eye chart here, and it's not my intent to have you read it all. It's simply my intent to give you a snapshot of what maritime activity looks like in part of my area of responsibility here up in the Northeast. Uh, these are competing, often conflicting, and overlapping waterways uses, and it creates a real conundrum on how you make sure that the waterways remain safe with all of this growing complexity. And frankly, uh, one of the ways we're trying to address this complexity is through the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, or NROC, for short. The group was formed over a decade ago in 2005 by the New England governors, who then invited uh, federal agencies that have particular expertise and relevant authority, like the Coast Guard, to come together uh, to discuss these regional ocean issues. And again, it was prompted uh, by the complexity of a very dynamic operating environment. Um, as I said, quite a conundrum for us. Again, another eye chart, and I apologize. This is a snapshot of the kind of complexity in the offshore environment. Um, the NROC uh, did a great job in launching a data portal uh, that provides access to critical information 
for agencies and stakeholders such as us to better plan and execute our responsibilities. Uh, this happens to show uh, the portal uh, for the offshore environment. Again, another snapshot uh, from the portal on what traffic trends look like in the previous panel showed sort of global uh, traffic trends. Um, this kind of data, the sharing of data, the sharing of information helps us better plan and allocate our resources. You know, we need to stay ahead of the power curve and the best way to do that is to have good, solid, sound scientific data to stand behind as we uh, allocate uh, those scare res scarce resources. And the federal government finally caught up with the New England governors uh, and a presidential executive order was issued to establish both the National Ocean Council and regional advisory councils. Uh, the one for New England here is called the Northeast Regional Planning Body. Uh, since the NROC was already established, the NROC basically was leveraged as the entity to uh, meet uh, that presidential directive and the entity to develop uh, the Northeast Ocean Plan. Uh, it was due in large part to the NROC's existence that New England was the first region in the nation to respond uh, to the presidential executive order. And this uh, Northeast Ocean Plan is meant to strengthen interagency coordination while enhancing the public's ability to participate in the process of managing resources. It doesn't dictate the way we're going to do it, but what it does is it sets up a framework to ensure collaboration and improve transparency uh, so that we are making the best decisions possible. So the NROC and the Northeast Ocean Plan sets up that framework for stakeholders to better plan uh, and ensure safety, security, environmental protection in the area. But we know that oceans don't stop at state, local, or national boundaries. And I don't think any symposium on the oceans, certainly not one from sea to changing sea, or a presentation like this titled Future of the Oceans would be complete without a discussion of the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. I've got a number of notes here, and I'm just going to sort of ad lib a little bit because I've lived uh, this issue uh, ever since I've been a lawyer in the Coast Guard. Um, many of you know that the United States is not a party to the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. The United States was the catalyst for the negotiation of that 1982 convention. Uh, we were dissatisfied with the 58 conventions. They were good, but they left many gaps that needed to be addressed. One of the most important of which was the breadth of the territorial sea. The other was the rights and obligations in the exclusive economic zone and issues like how do you claim sovereign rights over an extended continental shelf. For most of the convention, it was considered a huge victory for the United States. There were some serious deficiencies in what's called Part 11 of the original agreement, the deep sea mining provisions. There, had, there were forced technology provisions. Uh, President Reagan was not satisfied that the size of the International Seabed Authority, both its size and the authority to act, would be kept in check. So in 1994, we were able to conclude a separate agreement on Part 11 that fixed all the issues that President Reagan was concerned about. Now keep in mind, those were only very narrow issues that moved the, coast, moved the United States away from signing the convention at that point. Those issues were fixed in 94. But despite the fact that those were addressed, we still have not been able to get this convention over the finish line. The convention has 166 countries, including the European Union, yet we've not yet ratified it. Now the importance of the convention is that it sets up the international framework for cooperation on peaceful uses of the ocean. This is the umbrella over which all maritime activity should take place, peaceful maritime activity. There are comprehensive provisions on marine environmental protection, marine environmental research. It locks in rights concerning freedom of navigation that are critically important to us. It secures the limits of the territorial sea. It is foundational. We apply it as customary international law. I think we need to move forward and accede to the convention so that we can assert those rights and protections on the strongest legal footing possible, and that is treaty law. 
and I'm happy to talk about that in questions. In closing, let me simply leave you with this. We as a community are facing extraordinary challenges as ocean temperatures and sea levels rise, as marine life habitats change, and government simply cannot address this alone. The calculus is much more complex than one agency, and the calculus cannot be balanced unless we ensure that the full continuum of the equation meets its responsibilities. That full equation, those critical factors need to be validated and totaled. We must com collaborate, we must partner at different levels. Even those of us with disparate views, we need to share information and build on each other's good works, the good ideas, and the good practices. We need scientists to analyze data that industry and government collects so that we may do our business smarter and better. We need industry, industry to comply with environmental regulations to help achieve long-term sustainability. We need citizens to continue to be vigilant. It's like if you see something, say something. That applies to Homeland Security, but it applies to the protection of our oceans just as much. We must work collaboratively at all echelons, local, regional, and internationally. We in the Coast Guard look forward to working with you, and I thank you so much for this opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for a fantastic symposium. the first question, and I'll just ask one question, then we'll turn it uh, over to the audience. So here's my question. Uh, ten days from now, we're going to have a, uh, an election in this country. Most people probably know about that. Uh, <laughs> wh what you may or may not know is that right now there are two different teams who are working uh, to do the, in charge of the transition, depending on who wins the presidential election. Uh, Chris Christie is heading the transition uh, for the Republican uh, nominee, uh, Donald Trump, and Ken Salazar. Uh, is heading the transition uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, as part of the transition, what will happen, with whichever team uh, nominee wins, uh, they're going to come to all parts of the executive branch, including the Coast Guard, and they're going to ask you, uh, what are the pressing issues which the new administration has to address? And so my question is, uh, when the transition team comes to the Coast Guard, and if and when they meet with you. Uh, whichever team it is, it should make no difference which team it is. Your report should be precisely the same. Um, what will you tell them, or what do you think the Coast Guard should tell them uh, are the pressing issues the Coast Guard faces uh, in addressing the kinds of uh, topics uh, we're talking about here, and that's going to be the oceans and climate change? Well, I, I guess the first thing, uh, thanks for the question, I think uh, the first thing I would tell them is based on everything that you saw here, you're going to need a bigger Coast Guard. <laughs> the other thing that I would tell them is that they must remain committed to recapitalizing the United States Coast Guard. We're in the midst of a recapitalization efforts for our deep water fleet. Uh, we are just let a contract to uh, procure 25 offshore patrol cutters that will protect, project presence. Uh, down in the transit zone for counter drug primarily and uh, migrant interdiction operations. Uh, but it's about projecting that effective presence that I, that I talked about in the presentation. Uh, the next thing that I would tell them is they need to commit to building heavy icebreakers for the United States. Uh, I'm not going to say this is a Coast Guard icebreaker because it's a national asset. I think many people misunderstand that. This is a national asset that just happens to be painted red and has a Coast Guard stripe on it. Most people don't realize that the, coast, that the United States has one medium icebreaker that can only operate in the Arctic and only has one, let me say that again, one heavy icebreaker, the Polar Star. The Polar Sea, its sister ship, is welded to the dock in Seattle. We had to take parts off of it to keep Polar Star running. We are losing ground when it comes to building icebreakers to project effective presence in the polar regions. The next thing I would tell them is to ensure that we remain focused on the Arctic. Uh, it's an opening uh, area. We're continuing to see increased man-made activity, and the Coast Guard will be the maritime presence uh, in the Arctic, and so we must commit uh, to a sustainable Arctic presence. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we'll take questions. Uh, the price of asking a question is you should first introduce yourself. My name is David Arnold. Good afternoon. Who is holding out on the 1982 treaty and why? There are uh, a lot of members of Congress um, who believe that the convention is not in the best interests of the United States. Um, I think, and I'm just going to generalize here because I don't want to point to any particular individual. Uh, I'm just going to generally talk about some of the concerns that I've heard. The first is I think there's some misinformation out there. The problems that plagued the 1982 convention are still talked about as reasons why we shouldn't join. This convention is modified by the Part 11 agreement. So there's just fundamental misinformation. People talk about forced technology sharing. That, that's resolved. Uh, there are other people who don't like uh, the mandatory dispute resolution mechanisms. However, if you look at a lot of U.S. agreements, they have dispute resolution mechanisms in them. So I'm not sure why we're shying away from dispute resolution, especially when we carve out military activities, law enforcement activities, and, and other things that just aren't going to be subject to dispute resolution. Uh, I think there is uh, some concern about paying royalties uh, for um, exploration in the uh, extended continental shelf. Uh, there's a scheme set up through the convention that if you have an extended continental shelf, although you get sovereign rights to that extended continental shelf, and I should say parenthetically, we believe that if we follow the procedures in the convention, which we now hold as customary international law, but if we went through the process in the convention and secured the greatest legal footing possible, we could claim an extended continental shelf that's probably twice the size of California, or at least the size of California, it's huge, <clears throat> and we would get sovereign rights. And that means the ability to explore and exploit those resources beyond 200 miles. But this, the convention sets up a system where you have to pay a certain percentage of royalties to the International Seabed Authority, and people just don't like that. However, those provisions were negotiated in large part by the offshore industry back during the convention's negotiations. They have no problem with the royalty scheme. In fact, the royalty scheme only kicks in five years after you start production. A lot of wells are pretty much exhausted by the time you get to five years. So it's, it, those are just a, a few reasons. And, and again, there's just some bad information out there uh, beyond just stale information, just bad information out there. For example, I've heard some people say it would create a United States or a United Nations Navy. Uh, nothing I've seen says that. <laughs> says that um, mili military activities would just be subject to dispute resolution. We know that's not true. Hmm. Uh, and, and I could go on and on and on. But I, I think what we tried to do uh, a few years ago when we were trying to move it through the Senate as an administration uh, was to correct any misperception and to focus on what we see as a large strategic benefits to the United States, such as making sure that we continue to project global leadership on ocean policy making sure that we can secure those rights on the strongest legal footing possible, making sure that we can secure and, and perfect title to those resources on an extended continental shelf. I just want to add a quick comment to what the Admiral said, and that is it, it underscores the significant voice the nation's military has right now uh, on, on a lot of fronts. We have a national government which for decades has been largely paralyzed uh, by partisan uh, ship and by increasing distrust of, <coughs> of, the, of the government, uh, the nation's military has a distinctly reliable and credible voice uh, that can really help break some of the log jams on, on many of these pressing issues. Yeah. Hi, I'm Pete Gerges from Harvard University. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I have two questions. I'll start with the easy one. Uh, in light of your uh, commitment to appropriate resource management and uh, environmental protection and security, have you considered running for president? Question one. <laughs> And on a more, uh, on a, on a, uh, on a maybe a more difficult <laughs> note. Uh, so, um, I've uh, been part of the uh, National Science Foundation's council that oversees the U.S. academic research fleet, and one I can absolutely corroborate what the Rear Admiral said, and that is the icebreakers are a real problem, right? In that the U.S. academic community depends on those icebreakers for research in the polar regions, uh, and at this point, it's it's uh, it's a it's it's actually embarrassing that we're at the state we're at. But the question I have for you, sir, is do you see an opportunity to have academics engaged with your more daily and routine activities, given that we've lost about a third of our academic research fleet, and given that your ships maintain a, a more substantial presence, 
do you see a way that we can collaborate uh, across agencies, whether it's the U.S. Coast Guard and, and the and National Science Foundation or so on? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, I, I absolutely do, and I, I, I hope I mentioned some of those in my remarks. I, I think it's important for the scientific community and the academic community to help us um, push technology to protect the oceans. I, I mentioned oil spill detection. Um, we have real challenges now with some of the heavier oils that are being transported that actually sink. They don't float. You know, you can skim oil on top of the surface, or you can clean it when it hits the beaches. It's hard to clean up oil that has a specific gravity. What is it, greater than one? Somebody help me with science. Thank you. <laughs> 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 um, uh, Chemistry major. <laughs> but, but I think the other thing that's, that's very helpful, and I'm going to speak as the commander of the First Coast Guard District who has a large fisheries responsibility up here in New England, and that is to help us really develop the kind of metrics that we need to make sure that our enforcement actions are bearing fruit. You know, not in terms of penalizing the fishing fleet, but in terms of preserving the fish stocks. You know, is enforcement having an effect? You know, we can do it when we talk about Coast Guard counter drug efforts. We, we know generally how much cocaine is produced worldwide. We know how much we're catching. We have good detection and monitoring, so we know often when the bad guys go by because we just don't have the resources to get them. The equation's a little bit easier in counter drug. It's not easy when it comes to fisheries enforcement because each fish stock is different, each species is different, they're migratory, and I, I'm not sure we've got the best possible handle that we can on what the nature of the problem is. So, you know, I, I'm responsible for putting Coast Guard resources to use the most effective way possible. The only way I can do that is if I can circle back and look at metrics that say I'm having an effect. It's hard for me to do that in fisheries. We're working on it within the Coast Guard, but wow, wouldn't it help if academia and scientists uh, joined us in that effort? Hi, I'm Tanya Varte again. I'm a musician with interests in the sciences. Um, I was wondering how much the, um, how do you reconcile uh, the military experimentation that goes on in the oceans with sonars with the preserving the acoustical environment of the sea mammals and other sea animals? How, I know there is a conflict there that sometimes becomes the subject of discussion. Yeah, I, I, you're not going to like my answer to this because I'm not the expert on sonars and, and acoustics because no Coast Guard cutters have sonar. Uh, we took sonars off um, years ago. Um, so I, we're not the experts uh, by any means. Um, s somebody correct me if the new cutters have sonar on them. <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, but uh, no, we're, we're not the experts on uh, acoustics. I, I mean, I, I listened to the prior presentation with great interest, but it, it's not something that uh, you know, we focus on. What, what I found uh, more applicable to us were the uh, commercial vessel trends transiting through the right whale areas, and we do enforce the speed restrictions to protect the right whales. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't have a better answer for you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, the Admiral and Richard. For So uh, this has been a delightful symposium because of all the amazing presentations and great questions. Um, the first one, um, I was amazing. I was really pleased to learn about all the different metabolic pathways. I will mention that one of the poster uh, session people, uh, Joey Nelson, did her dissertation on um, uh, sulfur bacteria that uses sulfur as, a, as an energy source. Um, so you may want to see her. The second panel. Um, looked uh, somewhat sobering to look at the effects of temperature changes, especially this, this number that I guess if 30% of the sea ice, Arctic sea ice is, is left, that means that 70% has gone away and most of what is remaining is not old ice but it's, it's, it's just new ice and just seems like we're looking at a disaster there. Um, it also shows the incredible heat capacity, that, that little graph that showed how much of the heat capacity is in the atmosphere 
compared to how much is in the ocean. I mean, I kind of knew that conceptually, but to see it displayed was just, just really hit home to me. So that was, that was incredible. Um, we heard about very detailed engineering strategies about how to mitigate the risks of sea level rise because as, as we heard, already the, the sea level rise is baked into the atmosphere. I mean, we can make choices now about CO2 emissions, but it's coming and so we have to get prepared and it's our decision whether or not it's going to get really bad or whether or not it, it becomes manageable. So there's, uh, that was what we saw there. And then in the third panel, um, again, the, the effects of global warming. Um, I caught a sea bass over the summer in, off of Cape Cod, and we looked at it and said, what's this? And we had to get our little thing, and then the first thing says, like, yeah, it's global warming, you know, we tossed it back, and I just realized it was global warming, so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, it's, it's impressive the stress that we're putting on um, the New England um, uh, biomass out there, and um, I, I think, you know, next time I sit here that I have to stay away from a right whale area, I'll definitely be doing it. And, and finally, I think with the closing talk by the Admiral and, and just looking at the, the diversity of ways of, of looking at this, it just gets, gets me back to at least a somewhat hopeful state. I mean, I, I, when I was in the Marshalls as I opened up the talk, you know, I realized that, that we really are highly dependent on protecting the ocean, and, and all of us have to think about becoming protectors uh, of the ocean because it's something that affects all of us. And I hope the symposium today brought home that, and, and as you go home, you start to reflect on what you heard and uh, how you may contribute in some way. So thank you all, and enjoy the reception.